Next on Garden Line, we learn how to apply a repellent for protection against mosquito-borne infections. Leave at least two hours for this to dry. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we'll visit with SDSU's training coordinator for pesticide certification. He will demonstrate how to properly apply the mosquito repellent permethrin. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts are here to answer your questions with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden related concerns. So get ready to call in. The phone number for you to call is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions is John Keycafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, Extension Horticulturalist, Daryl Denneke, Extension Integrated Pest Management, and KC Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences. Helping to answer the phones tonight are the folks from the Dakota Prairie Master Gardeners. And remember, when you call in with your questions, please provide the phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it's affecting any other surrounding plants, and moisture or and soil conditions that exist. But first off, we're going to go around the table and hear from our panel on what is currently happening out there. And as always, John, we're going to start with you tonight uh, in the insect world. I'm going to start a little bit with a story tonight. I went down to Brandon last weekend and visited my mother-in-law. And first thing she asked as soon as I jumped out of the car was, what's making this mound of dirt in my lawn? She had this big pile of dirt with a hole. This hole is... Uh, Oh, about a half inch to three quarter inch in diameter. And this thing had kicked up a pretty good mound of soil out there. Now, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit more about it. And if you wanna see if you can figure out what you think this is, this sort of problem is not limited to just this one. In her lawn, it was just this one. But I do get questions about this every year, have for the last few years. And it's one of these things that seems to be happening more often, especially in the southeastern part of the state. Now, not to confuse anybody, this is still an insect problem. It looks like it could be some sort of animal uh, other than an insect, a little mammal maybe or something like that doing it. But this is actually an insect doing it. Some people call them ground wasps. Some people call them cicada killers. But these are large wasps, and these are solitary wasps. The females go out and build nests like this. They dig a, a hole, and they dig chambers in that hole, and they go out and hunt, in this case, cicadas. And when they find one, they sting it a couple times, they hit the nerve centers, and they paralyze it. And they drag that cicada back to their nest, and they take it underground, and they lay an egg on it. The reason they paralyze it rather than killing it is that their larvae cannot eat rotting meat. If they do, they'll die. So those larvae feed on the paralyzed cicada, in this case, and some of the other similar species, they'll feed on grasshoppers or other things. Um, and they save those vital organs for last. So they eat all the way around the outside of it, if you will, and work their way in so that poor insect victim is alive during the entire time it's being consumed. They're really not an issue for control unless you're absolutely terrified of them and you don't feel that you can have them around. I wouldn't necessarily classify them as beneficial. In this case, they're not doing anything that's going to limit populations, really, but kind of a neat creature to have around. With some of those that hunt grasshoppers or spiders or other things, 
they can have an impact on that local population out there. And if you do want to get rid of those things, if you don't want them in your lawn, probably the best way to do it is to simply water that area two to three times a day. Keep it really wet. They don't like that muddy soil condition. And doing that will discourage them from that area. And you can usually do that without killing them. Otherwise, if you can just tolerate them, they're unlikely to sting you. They're, uh, they're large wasps. Actually, Steve brought one in tonight as an example. Um, they are good-sized wasps. And uh, they look intimidating and they'll try to scare you, but they're unlikely to sting you unless you really force them to sting. They're one of our larger wasps there. So those are our cicada killer wasps, uh, solitary hunting wasps, and, and uh, kind of neat creatures to have around. So they're a pretty good size. I think that's where most people are concerned. It's just that, uh, boy, that's going to have quite a stinger to it and uh, cause some problems with me. And it has a good sized stinger on it. I mean, it's quarter inch long probably, um, so it can inflict some mechanical damage that way. But that venom that they use is really designed to paralyze another insect. It's not used as a defense really at all. And so even if they sting you, it's more likely to just be the, the physical pain of having that large sting stab into you. Can you describe to us just real quick, John, uh, the cicada you're talking about? what that is, so people know what that is? Right, if you're not familiar with those, the ones that we have around here are the dog day cicadas. They're a large black and green insect. They're the insects that sit up in the tree at this time of year and buzz at you. They make that kind of undulating buzzing sound. There are some species that uh, sound to some people like certain types of saws and things like that. Um, but it's the males that sit up in the tree and, and buzz at people. Okay. Thank you very much. Really fascinating. So you bet. Okay. Dave, what do you have for us? Well, I brought a sample from McCrory. Uh, I've noticed this on, this is a, from a pear tree at McCrory Gardens, and it's something that I've been seeing more and more of, at least in this tree, and I've seen it in some other areas as well. And this is one of the canker diseases that we see in pear, as well as it shows up in apple, and it'll show up in cotoneaster and a variety of other plants. I'm not absolutely certain this is uh, fire blight, but it certainly shows the symptoms of fire blight. If you notice the stem up here, the stem has turned essentially black and the leaves are almost black as well, dark brown to black. Uh, and you often see that what happens is that the water supply to the stem essentially gets shut off from this disease process. And when you get these high temperatures, the twig just dries up and curls up and you'll often get kind of a shepherd's crook they call it kind of the tip will kind of curl over because it's so succulent it just dries out and wilts essentially. Um, another sample here you can see even a more of a branch here's a, a one twig that's pretty much in, uh, affected this one is beginning to show signs of it we're seeing some blackening of those leaves uh, the key to if this is fire blight or really any of the canker diseases to get it pruned out and you want to prune well below where the source of the disease is and you might be tempted to just like cut this one off right here but you probably haven't controlled the disease because it's probably spread down in that stem quite a distance in fact uh, when I was collecting these samples I was peeling back the bark here and there and it was brown a good couple of feet below where this branch was on the tree so you want to probably move, remove that branch at its source on the tree if it's attached to a bigger crotch cut it off there uh, if it's a smaller branch and goes all the way to the main trunk, cut it off there. And you may actually want to disinfect your pruning shears and a 10% bleach solution in between cuts, uh, especially if you're kind of messing around with a pocket knife or something and trying to check and see where it's green and where it's brown. You could be spreading the disease to healthy parts of the tree. So you want to be kind of careful uh, working with this. Uh, it often spreads when we have wet conditions. It often spreads during uh, pollination time. These little spurs that will get on pear and, and apple trees where the flowers are, it can be transferred during wet periods of time by insects. Uh, they sit on the tree. The, if it's a bacterial disease, it'll exude little bacterial droplets along the side of the stem that get splashed around by rain into the flowers or spread by insects or by wind. And uh, that's how it can kind of spread around the tree. So wait for a dry day and go out there and get those things pruned off. And, the sooner the better. Okay. So pruning is, is by far the best control versus That's any kind of control. spray or chemical? or The only other option really is to use a, uh, uh, an antibacterial product uh, during flowering. And 
Streptomycin is the most commonly used product for that, but it's not really very easy to get. It's not really very reliable. If you've got a lot of fire blight, you just need to get out there and get it pruned out and uh, hope that you can get ahead of it. And in some cases, you aren't going to get ahead of it. Yeah. And this will spread to, like I say, a variety of other plants. Uh, mm -hmm. Very common on Cotonia aster and also very common on mountain ash. So it can be pretty serious in all those plants. Okay. And you did mention as far as disinfecting some of your pruning tools so mm -hmm. that hopefully you don't spread it every time you make another right. cut. How would you do that and what would you use? A 10% bleach solution works pretty well. And the easiest thing to do is if you can have two pruning shears, so you have a little container of this bleach solution, drip your, stick your pruning shears in there, make a cut, and then switch pruning shears and make the next cut with the other one and let the other one soak in between time. And that can be a way to keep it disinfected. And when you're done, rinse them off with clear water and dry them so that you don't have any corrosion developing. Chainsaw? Yeah, a little hard to dip a chainsaw yeah. on bleach solution, but <laughs> in some cases a chainsaw is going to be the best way to deal with it if you've got a tree that's badly infected and you've got, say, you've got an apple tree or a pear tree that's got lots of fire blight in it and you've got a small orchard or something with other apple trees and pear trees nearby, probably better to sacrifice that one tree than to deal with it getting throughout your orchard. Okay, good. Very good. And then I imagine with that bleach, you want to oil up your pruners at the right. end when you're yep. all done so they don't Clean them up, rinse them you. off, and yep, okay. give them a good shot of, of uh, lubricant or something okay. afterwards. Yep. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. Daryl, good to have you with us tonight. What do you have for us? Well, it's kind of the time of the year when we start talking about uh, some of those weed species that uh, we see blooming now. And, and one of the ones that uh, it's, it's gotten to be a problem in the last four or five years is yellow toad flax. And you can see the picture on uh, up there right now, and it's actually kind of pretty. And actually, it's what we call one of our escaped ornamentals, uh, butter and eggs. Uh, I might recognize the the name, uh, but uh, it uh, it's been around for a long time. Was brought across from Europe, uh, used for dye, uh, or uh, also ornamental. Actually, one of the early uses by the settlers was they they take the juice from that and put it uh, in milk and use it for uh, fly repellent supposedly works pretty good. Uh, we've seen this uh, plant really expand in the last several years, uh, not only uh, in lawns, like we see the picture there, but the previous picture in, in rights away and ditches and so on, and in, in uh, grasslands, pastures and so on. Very aggressive, it seems to be spreading, we don't really know why. Um, it does. It is a perennial and you can see the root system, so every one of those little buds is gonna produce uh, a new plant. And uh, besides the, uh, uh, the root system, that, that the aggressive root system it has, uh, it also produces a lot of seed. So we're getting kind of a double whammy. That, uh, uh, that pretty little flower there uh, puts out a lot of seed and it'll put it out for a long period of time. So we got a, a variation of time on a single stalk as far as the amount of seed. Uh, as far as uh, control, herbicide options, very limited. We really don't have anything that works really good. Uh, some of the Trimec products in lawns uh, will uh, kind of suppress it, but basically just try to keep that thing from going to seed and uh, keep those small those pa small patches from beginning, uh, becoming big patches. Okay. Thank you, Daryl. So. Casey, what do you have for us? Well, you know, it's uh, late July, and believe it or not, the, the fall migration is starting uh, for, for the birds. Uh, the shore, some of the shorebirds, which are very early nesters, are starting to show back up here in the prairies and getting lots of reports of, of them. And so it's time to be thinking about if you haven't got hummingbird feeders out this year, you, you, you were too late to get them out this spring for the migration. And now is about the time to think about getting them out for the fall. Uh, and the birds really start using them heavily uh, in early August and they'll, and they'll build in numbers and peak uh, about uh, mid-August and, and will carry through into September until they, until they depart. Um, <clears throat> and, and the reason is they're trying to build up all of the energy that they can prior to that big movement south and uh, you know they, they kind of move in, in a hopscotch fashion feeding along the way and if you have a good place for them to feed up they'll stick around for weeks uh, here in the fall and, and usually this is the best time of the year for hummingbirds if, if you uh, 
want them around your house and in your yard, now's the time to get those feeders out. And of course, this is the time if you've planted hummingbird attracted, attractive flowers, is when, is now is when you're gonna start seeing the most use. Things like salvia, uh, uh, hollyhock even, uh, th those kinds of flowers that are gonna be kind of reddish in color and provide some nectar, uh, really get a lot of use by hummingbirds. Uh, the, the solution for hummingbirds is a simple four parts water to one part sugar uh, syrup. Uh, make sure you change it rather frequently, particularly in hot days in the summer, otherwise it'll ferment on you and you'll have uh, kind of drunk hummingbirds around your yard. So. That could be interesting. Yeah. Some of the hummingbirds, so. <laughs> Uh, one thing that we've had a couple uh, people call in, and I had a question even from another county as far as they've noticed some, some dead birds. Uh -huh. uh, and I don't know if you've had any calls come in on that or what that might be, or would <coughs> West Niles be affecting maybe well, a few yeah, species? Well, you know, or? I have uh, got a couple of, of phone calls and emails from county uh, extension mm -hmm. folks, and uh, without knowing uh, that there wasn't any specifics on the the species of birds, how many there were, kind of what the situation was, uh, that would help a lot. So if, if you do have that kind of situation where you have uh, several dead birds, uh, take a picture, it'd be the easiest thing now with digital cameras and you can send it, get it to your local extension folks and they can forward it on to me and I can provide maybe some uh, educated guess as to what's going on. Remember, I mean, right now we've got a lot of young birds out there, mm -hmm. and natural mortality on young birds is really high, you know, upwards of 60, 70 percent or more, naturally. And so the nests fall out of trees, and you may have five nestlings laying there on the ground, and they're not going to make it. But that's just kind of the way of nature, and so uh, just be aware of that. But if, if that happens to you, and if, or if you think something's kind of, could be something fishy, you know, that you're, you're worried about. Just take a picture and, and send it on in. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, panel. So now we'll get into the questions and answers. Uh, the questions that have come in here so far are, for Dale here, uh, this is one on crabgrass. Uh, anything to do for crabgrass this fall? I have put down crabgrass preventer in the spring, but it still seems to come through. Kind of spotty uh, and so on, so. What are your recommendations there well, for fall, if, perhaps, if yeah. there is one? Crabgrass is an annual. Uh, we need to take care of that in the spring. The best way to do that is using a, a pre-emergent so we can prevent it from uh, germinating. That solves a big problem. There's a number of products that will help uh, do that. There are some post-emergence type things that we can do a little later on, uh, but uh, really that pre-emergence product is the best. As far as what we can do now and into the fall, the best thing we can do uh, when you go through, do your mowing and so on, uh, take those clippings off, be sure we don't have any seed being distributed because uh, crabgrass uh, does produce a lot of seed and need to keep that off of the lawn to prevent any problems for the, for the next year. But your preference would be a spring treatment more so than a I fall? I prefer a spring treatment, yeah. Fall really isn't gonna do you any good with an annual. Um, your best bet is to just get that seed off of there. Okay, uh, Dave, raspberries, should she cut the canes down in the fall or only pull out the dead canes? She has been advised, she's been advised to cut the canes back to six inches so that they would bear more fruit in the summer. Well, it kind of depends on what type of raspberry she has. If she has the typical uh, early summer fruiting raspberries, which are probably in production right now, uh, that's a biennial cane. That cane starts growing in the spring of one year and it doesn't produce fruit until the following summer. So if that's the kind of raspberries that you have, uh, those after they're done fruiting, it's a good idea to cut out the canes that produce fruit. Those canes are going to turn brown and look pretty bad after a few weeks. Uh, get those canes pulled out. Then also you want to do a second pruning in, during the dormant season preferably in the spring. Uh, go in there and thin out the canes that are left so that you've got cane spaced about three or four per foot at most. And narrow up that row so it's not a big wide hedge of a group of plants. That's going to help reduce some of the disease problems, give those plants more room to grow, and produce a, a better crop of fruit. Now if you have the primal cane fruiting raspberries, which start fruiting probably in the next month or so, uh, 
those are going to produce fruit on canes that grew up this spring. So for those, you can cut the canes down to the ground in the fall after they've frozen and then have nothing there over the winter time that's going to get knocked over in the snow and deer and so forth. Then those new canes will come up in the spring. You'll get that crop of fruit in the fall. So those are, in many cases, kind of an easier crop to deal with for us. The only problem is if we have an early frost, you don't get a whole lot of fruit out of them. But a lot of people enjoy those primal cane fruiting varieties and have really good success with them. Okay. Well, Dave talked a little bit to us here as far as pruning. Uh, this one comes to us from Sioux Falls. Uh, and it's the, the first picking, the raspberries were clear, no bugs. Now little black bugs are showing up on the fruit. How to prevent these little bugs and get rid of them? They do indicate that they were there last year as well, John. So, Yeah, uh, they're one of those things that they'll be there every year. I don't know that we're going to be able to get rid of them, really. These uh, little black bugs that you're dealing with, these beetles are what are commonly called picnic beetles or sap beetles or some people call them beer bugs. They go to almost anything that's edible, uh, by human standards anyway, and some things that might not be. They really like some overripe fruit or fermenting products. And so as far as getting rid of them, especially when you're harvesting those raspberries at this point, there's not much that you can put on them chemically to deal with them. What you might try doing is putting out something that would be even more appealing to them than the raspberries and see if you could lure them away from the raspberries and over onto something else. Um, you know, that common name of beer bug implies one of the things they like. They do like uh, the smell of beer, and so if you'd set out saucers of beer, kind of like you would for uh, slug traps, you may be able to lure a number of those beetles over to those, those saucers like that. Um, rising bread, you know, bread dough with yeast in it has that same attractive effect on these beetles. And again, you just want to make sure you get them far enough away that you're getting the beetles out of that area and to someplace else and that you're not actually just pulling more to your raspberries, but uh, other than that, I'm not sure what else you might try on. Well, just you, you mentioned that they like the ripening, overripe fruit, so the key, I think, to help reduce the problems is just make sure that you're picking thoroughly. And that takes some time with raspberries. They tend to kind of hide underneath the leaves and so forth, but just take an extra few minutes, and I like to walk down one side of the row and then walk back in the opposite direction down the same row and you'll see raspberries that you might have missed on the first picking. The other thing is to pick more frequently so that you don't have that fruit, get, fruit getting overly ripe. And that's going to help reduce the problem, but they're going to keep coming back. That's just part of the problem. Yeah. And they'll get into other crops mm -hmm. as oh, yes. well. I mean, this is not limited to raspberries. We see huge problems with them in sweet corn yep. and in, at times, tomatoes and any sort of fruit, they get into apples later in the season and anything where they can enter that fruit and, and get in there and do some feeding damage on it. Okay. Just keep picking and keep current on that, harvesting some. Yeah, best idea. Okay, KC, this one is from Rapid City. Deer lives by Canyon Lake and the deer eat absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. uh, he knows the best answer would be a fence but does not want to fence. He's tried hollyhocks, iris and so on but they eat everything, no matter what they, they put in. Any suggestions of deer-proven plants that maybe uh, deers are not uh, encouraged or like to stay away from? Also, the bucks tend to tear up some of the trees with their antlers. So right. Kind of a two-part question there if you um, answer that. Boy, uh, I, I'm not aware of any plants that, that are kind of repellent to deer. Um, in the south, they even eat greenbrier, which is... When, when you look at it, you would think, how does anything eat that with those big thorns? But they love it. Um, there are some chemical repellents on the market for deer, and, and the local conservation officers uh, have told me that they've, they've uh, uh, tested some of those uh, with, I think, mixed results. Um, you, could, you could talk to the, the, the local game fishing parks folks in Rapid City, and they might be able to to help you, but I, I think you you had the best solution is is to keep them out. And I used to live in the Black Hills and Hot Springs and and uh, love to garden, uh, but could never grow one there until I put up and I just put up a three wire electric fence across the back of my property and kept the deer out and, and had a great garden. But that was that was the best solution. Uh, but with those electric fences, the <laughs> one thing that people don't always understand when you're trying to keep something like that out, it's a good idea to bait the fence. 
So mm -hmm. for deer, for example, you'd actually want to hang something on that fence like peanut butter or apples or something on there so that they actually come and touch that fence with their nose a couple times first. And once they get hit with that electric shock a couple times, then they learn to stay away from it. Otherwise, they may get lucky enough that they don't touch it or not in a sensitive spot and they right. might ignore an electric fence. Yeah. And I, um, I, I, I did that. I just hung a little can mm -hmm. uh, with with some water in it, actually. And I, I think they were curious enough that they went up and touched it and probably got <laughs> sparked in their nose. And the other thing was I put a wire, one of the wires only about uh, uh, probably eight inches off the ground for the young to keep the young deer out, plus the neighborhood dogs that like to come in my yard. That worked on those as well. So. <laughs> Maybe the dogs are a good idea. Get a pack <laughs> well, of large yeah. dogs and keep them on the hungry side. Yeah. Something to make the deer uncomfortable and yeah, and, and I think like John said, it just takes once. Once they become uh, conditioned to that, there's I'm going to get shocked if I'm, I'm there. You know, there's easier picking somewhere else. Okay, yeah. uh, Daryl and Dave. This one comes to us from Yankton. They have a bluegrass lawn. However, uh, they say zosia grass. They feel. Is starting to show up and taking over, thick, uh, dense, spreading. Um, but then they also go into pros and cons. Should I keep the zosia grass or get rid of it? Well, zosia grass is one of those grasses that you'll see advertised a lot. We get a lot of questions about it. You'll see it in the Sunday supplement sections, you know, this fantastic lawn and everything. Um, I've got buffalo grass in my yard, which is very similar to zosia grass, and it's another warm season grass. Of course, every spring I go through about a month and a half worth of why'd you kill your lawn? How come your lawn is brown? What's happened to your dead lawn? Why don't you have grand green grass in your lawn? Because it doesn't green up until in June usually, which is kind of nice if you don't want to mow the lawn, which is kind of why we put it in there. You can see the same issue with the zoysia grass. And the problem when you have it mixed together is the, the bluegrass turns green in the spring and the zoysia grass is still brown. Now, during this time of year, it probably doesn't look too different. And if it continues to stay warm and gets dry, the bluegrass is going to start turning brown and the zoysia grass is still going to be green. So during the hot part of the summer, zoysia is kind of a good thing to have, just like buffalo grass is kind of nice to have when it's hot and dry because it tends to stay green. But you're continually dealing with that cool season grasses and cool season weeds. I've got a lot of weeds in my buffalo grass that I wish I didn't have, and I just don't have a real good system of getting rid of them. As far as trying to control the zoysia grass, that can be an issue too. That's going to be an issue because I don't know of anything selective that no. we're going to, you could be real careful and try to work between the warm season and cool season and that's that's pretty tricky. Uh, it, it'd just be a lot easier if you're going to renovate and go with one right. one species or the other. And uh, as far as weed control, like you said, between the two you've got species that are going to be tough and then the ones that come in during the warm season part of the year uh, you're going to have to be real careful because you're going to have some possible drift issues and different things that could have more problem than what you really want. Right. Yeah, it's a tough one. And, and mm -hmm. I say the, if you have one or you have the other, you can deal with that pretty well. But if you got the two mixed together, people think, well, gee, that'd be good because you get <laughs> the best of both worlds. Well, you kind of get the worst of both worlds and it doesn't work out real well. So if they would make a decision to go with one or the other, is there a recommendation on how to take one or the other out? Well, it's easier to take out the cool season grass okay. because you can spray that with Roundup in the spring when the, buff or the uh, mm -hmm. zoysia grass is still dormant. Or wait until it goes dormant in the fall and then spray the, the cool season grasses with Roundup and you're going to kill them and keep the warm season grasses. Now, I've been trying that with my buffalo grass, but you've got to really be careful because mm -hmm. that starts to green up in the spring and you hit it with Roundup, you've got dead patches in the grass too. So. It's a difficult issue to deal with. My problem is I've got a lot of fox t foxtails and things like oh. that, so I'm going to try the crabgrass preventer next year and yeah. see if that will help reduce some of that problem. And I've also got thistles and some other things. Yeah. This one comes to us from Sioux Falls. Container garden, tomatoes. Bottom half of the tomatoes rotten. What should she do? Well, I think this is our first <laughs> call. Um, blossom end rot, which is a perennial problem that we see with tomatoes as well as some other fruits, particularly tomatoes, but sometimes peppers and we'll sometimes think we see it on some of the cucurbit crops. But in tomatoes especially, what happens is we have an imbalance of calcium in the plant. And when that tomato is loaded with fruit and it's trying to develop those fruit, 
there just isn't enough calcium to go around and the cell walls and the, and the fruit don't have enough calcium, they kind of deteriorate and they rot and turn black. So the best solution is not to add more calcium because there's already probably plenty of calcium in the soil. It's when we have these hot dry spells and then it gets wet and then it's dry again. Try to even out that moisture uh, situation in the garden. We talk about mulching that helps with the weed problems as well as helping to manage the moisture content. This was a container garden. Okay. So. So that's going to be even more difficult with, especially if the container is relatively small. If you're going to try growing tomatoes in a container, you need a good size, big container so that you've got more soil volume there to hold moisture. And when it gets hot and dry like it's been the last this week, you might have to water that container a couple times a day. And if you're letting it dry out once in a while, that's going to set you up for this kind of a problem. Okay, good. Well, thank you, panel. Mm -hmm. We have some important and timely health information for you tonight. Since we are entering the peak season for mosquito species that carry West Nile virus, Garden Line met with Extension Pesticide Applicator Training Coordinator Jim Wilson. Jim explains the proper method to apply permethrin, an insect repellent that is applied to clothing to help protect against mosquito bites. I'm Jim Wilson, Extension Pesticide uh, Education Coordinator at South Dakota State University. When you find yourself in those situations where mosquito populations are extremely high and you find you need to work in those areas anyway, we do have some other options other than strictly insect repellents. Uh, just the other night as I was working through my bees and peas and beans trying to uh, move that foliage, mosquitoes were just boiling out. Uh, for those situations, we do have an option uh, to consider that is a permethrin product that is for use on clothing. And uh, make sure you read this label closely. Uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to find. Look in the camping sections, perhaps, of the stores. Uh, clothing and permethrin are what are we look at, what we are looking for. Uh, this product can be applied to clothing, and as we read the label, it, it indicates you know shake the product well, of course. Uh, spray about six to eight inches away from the clothing, taking about 30 seconds to, to spray one side of the clothing. And you can see a dampening of, of the clothing. And it looks as though we need to get that just a little bit of a color change, a little damp, in order to get a sufficient amount on. When we complete the one side, we need to flip it over, spray the other side, and then leave at least two hours for this to dry. This is not to be applied to clothing that is, that is being worn. It must be applied, um, again, without being worn. I would button the shirt up to make sure we don't get any more on the inside of the clothing than, than, than necessary. This will last up to about six weeks and will stand up to several washings. About three quarters of a can will do a shirt, pants, and socks. And we might also indicate that not only mosquitoes, but it does help uh, prevent uh, uh, ticks as well. Um, since this is worn on the skin, or worn on the clothing, not on the skin, uh, we certainly do need to uh, use insect repellents on the areas of the skin uh, that are, are not covered by the, by the clothing. Uh, I, found, I found this to be, uh, be a, an excellent product, gives us a little extra protection. It has some repellency, but when a tick or mosquito crawls on the fabric, there's enough, uh, enough uh, in insecticide there to also provide some control. Well, we want to thank Jim for that information because we are getting into that season uh, where it's pretty critical if you're going to be outside and you're in an area that uh, there's a lot of mosquitoes to, to kind of protect yourself against that West Nile virus. Uh, so, and I know the mosquitoes are out there. They sure are around my place. So. They're hungry today. Oh, they are, yeah, <laughs> especially when there's no wind at all. So, uh, We, as every other week, uh, we encourage our viewers to uh, send in some questions and actually... Uh, 
uh, visual pictures of some of the questions and concerns that they have out there and this week we did receive some and the first one we have here is a question from Rapid City can you tell me what this is what kind of caterpillar is it going to be and the good things it can do to my yard John I, I think maybe a better question would be what kind of caterpillar was it uh, the caterpillar stage comes before the adult stage in these cases and maybe the idea here is that it's going to lay some eggs and there'll be more caterpillars next year. Uh, specifically this species is Ceratomia undulosa which probably doesn't mean a whole lot but it's what's called the waved hawk moth. So just by chance I had a question yesterday about what tomato hornworms turn into and this is not the same species but this is a very similar species. So this is a large hawk moth. These are the sort that hang around flowers late in the evening and people sometimes think that they've got hummingbirds flying after dark and really it's these moths instead. During the day they rest on tree trunks like that and, and hope that they can just camouflage themselves well enough to hide. Uh, the caterpillars in this case will be large green hornworms. They'll have that horn on the, the rear end of the, the caterpillar as well that they use something as defense, uh, more to confuse possible predators in this case, and they'll feed on a wide range of trees, uh, ashes, oaks, and a number of other plants as well. So you may find some of those on there. Not really an economic issue in any sort or nothing that you'd even feel a need to control, so more of a curiosity than anything else. In this case. Okay, we go from Rapid City to Sioux Falls, and the next picture we have uh, is a picture that was taken uh, where they found this garden in Sioux Falls. And the picture that we have up here is, uh, the question is, do you have any comments on this? And uh, this might lead a little bit into maybe what we just talked about, Dave, as far as uh, making sure we have adequate moisture there. And um, right. uh, are there any benefits to what you see there? Well, I see it looks like there might be some watering drip hoses or something. Yeah, some of it. Yep. it looks like some yep. drip irrigation yep. system set up there. So I think they're thinking mm -hmm. about the watering issue with these. And really, it looks like those are about five-gallon buckets, and that's probably about the smallest size bucket that you want to use if you're going to try to grow a tomato. And I'd also encourage you to, to look for, in a garden center or to buy the seed yourself, look for the patio type or some smaller types of tomatoes as opposed to a great big tomato plant that's going to just going to overwhelm the size of that bucket. And they've got them all hung up there on that little structure that they've got there, which is kind of neat. Uh, maybe they're going to keep them out of the range of deer. I don't know exactly where that comes in, maybe, but uh, I don't know, you can do all kinds of things. For a while, the uh, topsy-turvy tomato things were real popular. I've been hearing less and less about those lately. Uh, I think this is a, probably a better system than trying to do that. Maybe whoever's growing these has trouble bending down, and they're going to keep them right at easy harvesting height. So certainly worth a try. I'd be concerned about you know, how these are going to blow around in the wind if those plants get some good size to them. They could start getting snapped off if they're that close together and the wind comes up and they start swinging around there a little bit. So a variety of concerns there, but you can grow tomatoes in lots of different containers. Mm -hmm. So Now it looked like they had the watering aspect pretty well mm -hmm. addressed, but uh, drainage also should be an issue with that? Well, Just you certainly don't want to have a container that doesn't have a drainage hole in it. You want to be able to allow that excess water to drain out. And so if you're going to use a bucket, drill some holes or punch some holes in the bottom of that bucket to let the excess water drain out. Okay. The next one comes to us from Watertown, and this is an endless summer hydrangea. Planted within 10 to 15 feet of the base of a 50-year-old evergreen right in front of a, a clematis on the west side of the house. I amended the soil when they planted it three to four years ago second or third year of endless summer on the, uh, on the market is what it was. And I fertilized occasionally with uh, miracle Grow, the acid type fertilizer here. Yeah, in Watertown, yes, there was a wet area, six feet or more of snow, but dry now. Has been uh, wilting in the heat and I've been giving it some water, but was concerned about the bad color and where that may be coming from. Uh, any thoughts? Well, it looks to me like you're dealing with some micronutrient deficiencies there, probably iron, uh, possibly also man manganese, uh, which are the two main elements that we see causing that intervenal chlorosis, where you get the tissue in between the veins turning yellow, and in this case, almost white. Uh, talk about the soil a little bit. I, I would investigate that soil. It, it look, it, I'm guessing that there's just some real soil issues there. 
Uh, you know, typically, we think of a high pH. They said they're using some uh, acid-forming fertilizers, which are good, but that soil pH might still be a little bit too high, and we're just going to continue to have that problem with that plant. So I'd suggest maybe trying to transplant that plant to a new location, uh, maybe mix some peat moss or something in with the soil in a good-sized area around that plant to help acidify that soil a little bit, or some elemental sulfur. But I think you're going to continue to have a problem with this plant, and certainly it's going to be more of a problem when you have wet conditions. Okay. Uh, the next one comes to us from Brookings, and they have a two-year-old delphinium. Seems to be declining rapidly. The leaves are yellowing from the bottom up along with the stems as well. Am I not watering enough? Also, should I be cutting the plants back? Well, delphiniums are perennial, and they normally produce a nice big flower spike uh, early summer, usually probably in the uh, first part of July or so. And if you look at the stems in the big image there, you can see that a lot of those are now starting to go to seed. And that stem essentially is just mature, and it's kind of finishing up its job. It's producing seed, and it's going to probably die back after the seed is produced. Uh, the best way to handle this probably is after the flowers have faded, cut the stem back to just where the leaves start at the top of that stem, leave the leaves that are there behind, and that's going to give that plant a chance to kind of recharge and it's going to realize that, gee, I'm not producing any seed, I guess I better try again, so it's going to produce more flowers. So we often get a second crop of flowers from delphiniums early in the, in the fall or late summer, and you can en get to enjoy the plant a little bit longer that way. The other caveat with delphiniums is they often tend to be kind of short-lived perennials, maybe three to five years or so, and then they kind of tend to die out, and you just have to start over again. Okay. The next one comes to us from Beersford. Uh, they indicate their parents are having a problem with zucchini plants for the past couple of years. The plants become massive, and the zucchini itself either grows to be very big, about a foot long and four to five inches in diameter, uh, or they get three inches long and start to rot. This year they decided to plant them in virgin soil, but the plants are still massive. I have attached a picture showing the plant that we have here that is up. The zucchini plant is planted next to tomato plants. The plants get plenty of sunlight, water, the ground, the garden is covered with black plastic tarp. We have cut off some of the leaves on one of the plant, but uh, it has not done much good. Uh, any ideas or thoughts? Well, cucurbits will respond to excess nitrogen and getting really big and not tending to produce as much fruit. And I don't know if that's the case as this is virgin soil. They didn't mention if they've applied any fertilizer, especially nitrogen to that site. So I'm not sure if that's coming into play here. But generally a big plant is going to start flowering and producing fruit. And we've talked about this on earlier shows. You got to have some of John's friends in there to pass that pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers in order to get fruit development. And when it's really hot like it's been, uh, I don't think that flower, that female flower, is receptive for very long. At least it's not producing nectar very long. So you don't get as much pollination going on. So the fruit that's getting three inches long and rotting probably did not get pollinated adequately. And if they're getting fruit that are getting to be really big, they're apparently getting some fruit to production, but they need to get in there and harvest those fruit a little bit more frequently, search around that plant a little more carefully, and get some of those fruit out when they're at a better eating size. Although some people like big zucchini and big summer squash like that. I think they're better when they're about six or eight inches long, if so at most. So harvest a little bit more frequently and uh, do everything else like they're doing, I think, and they should have more fruit production. But it's just, I think the hot weather has been a part of the problem. Okay. The next one comes to us from Black Hawk, and they, boy, you know, can you folks help me out with this, is what they start out with. The pictures uh, are showing to you here happens to our peas. The soil is silt made up of mostly uh, parts of humus and dissolved gypsum, which are very abundant here in the Black Hawk area. The soil was fertilized with a 12, 24, 6 at seeding time. Uh, I don't think the seeds have been inoculated up to this point. They've been watered with overhead sprinkling and rain. Soaker hoses will be used from here on. We have had this problem for several, several years, even though we rotate every year. Can you help me out on uh, what this might be and how to help curb it? So. Well, my guess is if they're talking about still trying to water these peas and keeping them going with soaker hoses and everything, that the problem actually is they need to get the peas in the ground a little earlier next year. Uh, peas are a cool season crop. They don't like temperatures up in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and I know it's been pretty hot out in that part of the, of the state as well. 
And I think those pea plants are just kind of shutting down, they're, they're stressed out, and they just aren't going to produce very well at this time of year. So try to get those peas in the ground, peas we can plant in the ground. It's really as soon as you can get in there and, and work that soil, peas will tolerate the cold soil temperatures and will tolerate even some light frost when they first start coming up. But you got to get that crop of peas in early and then you're going to get some good peas. And by this time of year, usually they're shutting down and they're done. Uh, now the other option is to try a fall crop of peas. And you might actually want to try replanting some peas about now so that as those plants start going and getting established, the cooler weather we hope is going to be showing up this fall and give them a little bit better chance there. Uh, I would be careful about not overdoing the fertilizer. I don't know how much they put down with the fertilizer that they mentioned, but take it easy on the fertilizer. Um, Hopefully that'll help them out. Okay. The next one comes to us from Faith. Uh, they planted potatoes twice because of cool, wet conditions. The problem started about 10 days ago with just a couple of the plants. It is now spreading down the rows. This is the second year for this particular spot, but have bought new seed potatoes each year to avoid disease. At first I thought it might be bugs, but didn't see anything. Not even a potato bug. The leaves curl up into a tight ball, and some plants are showing signs of brown leaves. The rows are irrigated. No top watering has been done. Dave, Daryl, any thoughts on that particular I one? guess I'd like to know a little history uh, of that particular piece of ground. Um, how long they've been, uh, that's been into a, a potato patch because when you start getting a reaction from a particularly broadleaf plant like that, it, it looks like a residual from a broadleaf a herbicide that's got some re actual residual activity. And uh, some of those products that we have out there right now, uh, they can last for two, three, four seasons, and actually a couple of them even longer than that. Uh, one thing they could do, um, we could uh, try to get a, a sample uh, to get a, a residual test on it to see what we have. Uh, unfortunately, we don't do that at SDSU anymore, so we'd have to find a different lab. But uh, uh, that would be one thing we could see if there is residual showing up in the soil. But that is what it looks like. One other comment I'd make, I, I didn't notice any mulch in that picture. Right. But if you're using broadleaf herbicides mm -hmm. on your lawn and you put grass clippings around your broadleaf plants like potatoes or tomatoes or beans, any of those uh, broadleaf plants, you can get some carryover damage that way too. So. They didn't say anything about applying herbicides, but I agree, Daryl, it looks to me like there's some herbicide effect going on there with those plants. Okay. Casey, <clears throat> this comes to us from Kimball. And uh, the age-old question here of, uh, boy, what do I do now? Uh, they had a trap out for rabbits near the garden but caught a skunk. How do I remove the skunk without smell? And she lives in a res uh, residential area and needs to get rid of that skunk. Um, yeah, you, you, carefully. <laughs> uh, but but actually it's not very difficult. You can take an old coat or an old blanket and just walk up to the trap with the blanket in front of you, slowly put it over, uh, and then you can pick the trap up and move it to where uh, wherever you want to release it. I would, I would uh, if she doesn't have a pickup, if she's in a residential neighborhood, I would find a friend. I wouldn't put it in your car. Uh, find a friend with a pickup, put it in the bed, take it out in the country to a place and, and, uh, and then just um, pull the coat up far enough that you can open the door and release it and usually then the skunk will, will just run away. Okay. Um, they're, they're fairly easy to handle. Mm. Sounds pretty simple. Yeah. <laughs> there's, if, if you do happen to get sprayed, <laughs> uh, the, there's a, actually a very good uh, recipe for removing skunk odor of uh, hydrogen peroxide and baking soda, about a quarter of a cup of baking soda to uh, a quart bottle of hydrogen peroxide. Add a little bit of either dishwashing, liquid dishwashing soap or liquid laundry soap to cut through the oil on, on wherever you're trying to wash. But the, you'll get a lot of foaming and what that's doing is producing a lot of oxygen. And, and, and what you're doing is oxygenating uh, the, the, the putrefaction smell, um, which is what, what that uh, skunk odor is. 
And so, and, and that works fairly well. Okay, mm -hmm. from personal experience, that concoction will kill lawns quite oh. nicely as well. <laughs> I have a dog that likes to get into skunks and uh, yeah. It does a number on a lawn, so I. But I, it does take the smell. It out. takes the smell out very nicely. It <laughs> yeah. works very well. Yeah. But <laughs> be caution where you do that. Clean. I'm. So. I'm well, and I'm glad that <clears throat> she's having dealt with this problem a couple times of catching a skunk in a live trap. I'm glad it's someone else dealing with it and yeah. not me. I've never been sprayed, but it it is just a little bit of a tense situation getting it out of there too. Okay. Dave, the next question comes from uh, Mitchell. Best time to fertilize is an old asparagus vet. Well, actually, right now is a pretty good time to do some fertilizing with asparagus. Uh, you should have that fern growth up there right now, and the plants are probably going to be four or five feet tall even. So just use a, a, you can even use just an ordinary lawn fertilizer, one that doesn't have any herbicides in it. Uh, just put about a pound per 100 square feet or so, and that's going to give you a pretty good uh, shot of nitrogen there. You can also use compost, or you can use composted uh, manures of some sort. Uh, you just want to get some nitrogen in there essentially and that's going to help that plant to be even healthier and more vigorous and store up more carbohydrates for next year. Okay, uh, mulch, the, the mulch with straw, uh, do you just plow it under in the fall or do you rake it off? Well, it depends how much mulch you have uh, and what you're trying to grow afterwards. If you've got you know, a heavy crop of mulch or, or straw around your tomato plants, for example, and you've got that three or four inches thick, you might want to try to pick up some of that mulch and, and then probably try to get it tilled in as best you can. If you till a lot of straw into your soil, uh, you can get some nitrogen deficiency symptoms showing up because that, the microbes that break down the straw are going to kind of use the nitrogen that's available there to break down that straw. So you're probably better off to rake up most of it and then till what's left in. Okay. Daryl, this one comes to us from LaBolt. They have grass in with their hens and chicks to seed them wants to know if post is still available or is there something else that can be used to remove the grass from around the, the sedum. Uh, can they also use it around lilies? Use it once again, post. Yeah, yep. and, and post is still out there. I'm not sure how the labeling on that calls for those particular I'm plants. I'm doing it around lilies. Uh, the little, yeah, lilies I would be, I, I don't think that'll work. I don't yeah. think you'll find that on the label. Uh, but the they, uh, post is around and I would make sure I check the label to make sure that the species they're going to use are on that label. I suspect that probably sedum and hens and chicks are not on the label probably. either, yeah. but it might say ornamental plants or yeah. something like that. Okay. Uh, Sioux Center, Casey, uh, they've got uh, Martin houses, uh, but they've noticed that uh, there's some sick, unhealthy uh, young birds in there. Some seem healthy. 14 nests all have Martins in there that have hatched. Any suggestions or reasons for the dead or maybe the sick birds or anything that they can do or is that some of that mortality you were talking I, about? I where think there's some natural mortality <laughs> and, and uh, uh, it varies year to year with the, with the swallows and the martins. Uh, they're, they're entirely insect eat, eat flying insects and so uh, and we haven't really had any cool snaps uh, recently uh, but sometimes you'll get a cold snap and the insect we just won't get a hatch off and they may go for a couple of days without having adequate food and that can really stress them. Uh, and so, uh, and sometimes really hot weather will do the same thing. And maybe that's what's going on here. Um, I that would be my best guess is that they just they had a hard time finding food. Most uh, purple martin, the houses that I've seen are metal. And if we right. get in those hot days we've had, it can get extremely you warm. You can get there, really, so. you can cook yeah. them, yep. So, uh, well, we have you here, wrens, uh, they have wrens. Uh, what is the incubation time for the wrens? Uh, it's the first year the wrens have used their birdhouses and they've packed the nest just overflowing uh, in there. What can they feed them and how large is the clutch? So they got a multiple questions here on okay. wrens. And then the old, the old wise tale is what they were told is that if they overpack their, um, their nest, that means we're going to have a uh, bad winter. Well, I haven't heard that <laughs> one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the house wrens, which I, I hear them singing all over there, everywhere, their average clutch is probably going to be four to six eggs. Uh, the incubation time is going to be about 10 to 11 days. And then from when they hatch out, it's going to be probably 
another 12 to 14 days, and then those young are going to be out of the nest. Don't worry about feeding them. There's nothing that you could buy except maybe mealworms uh, that you could put out that they would eat. They're, they're insect eaters. Uh, let them forage and, and do you a favor and clean up some of the insects around your, around your yard. Okay. I think I answered all the questions. I think you did. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. So. And that's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line does repeat twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3 also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Fridays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your lo local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now it's time to wrap up. Thanks to our panel of experts, John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, Extension Horticulturalist, Daryl Denneke, Extension Integrated Pest Management, and K.C. Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the folks from South Dakota Prairie Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. On behalf of the entire crew, have a good evening and happy gardening. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications.